Hello, today we are visiting an incredibly beautiful two-generation apartment that was built in the late 20s. It still belongs to the descendants of the original owners and it's a really special experience to be here. There's a set of original items, some newly restored, very sensitively. And we're really in a setting that is absolutely remarkable in the combination of materials, colors, and has a fantastic atmosphere. So guess where we are this time? Pilsen and you'll see several interiors like the one you saw a moment ago and that's because a couple of friendly families bought from the extremely important architect Adolf Loos commissioned renovations to their homes especially the interiors so from the outside these are houses that look quite unassuming but inside they are really fascinating and it's a whole different world you'll see for yourself Luz was perfectly aware that there are parts of the apartment that are important and parts that are a little less important and the spatial arrangement corresponds to that. So we're in the living room, the most important room where you spend maybe the most time where you invite visitors and suddenly it's this huge tall space that's been created because the floor we're standing on has been radically lowered from the original layout of the house and actually up on the gallery we see the normal size of the floor which shows how, for example, a dining room or a study or individual other living rooms can be really low, but here you're experiencing something incredibly generous. And again, when you think about what the house looks like from the outside, it's quite surprising. There are probably only two major spatial concepts of housing in the 20th century that are still copied today. The first is by the Swiss-born architect Le Corbusier, and it's called Plan Lieber. That means the columns are load-bearing and the walls are completely free, and you can do whatever you want with them. So the thing is held together by the columns and the other stuff is really loose. And the other is the round plan, which is loose invention, or the space plan, where he says that not all the rooms have to be the same height, because the living room is important, it has to be high. The dining room you sit in, it can be lower there. In the bathroom and in the bedroom you lie down, so there can be even lower. And try to put together these different rooms of different heights. And it doesn't look very interesting in the floor plan, but when you visit the thing afterwards and you see how rich the thing is, how it fits together, you suddenly realize that in a space that was originally designed as a simple apartment, if you just handle it differently, you create a much richer spatial experience. Adolf Luce loved England. He brought a lot of the principles from there and a lot of the things that he subsequently applied to all his clients, he tried out on himself first. In 1903, he designed a refurbishment of his apartment in Vienna. And even though it was a relatively small apartment, he still had this fireplace in it, made of masonry with a beautiful copper cover. And he actually spent a lot of time there. And if you want to see the apartment, you can, because in 1958, it was moved to the Historical Museum in Vienna, and it's really on display there. So I find that terribly sympathetic. First I try it on myself, then I use it on somebody else. I don't know if you'd think we could expect another fantastic interior behind those doors, so we'll see.
We're in the apartment of Hugo Semler, brother of the previous owner, and we see the situation is a little worse. It's basically a ruin in need of renovation. But I find it quite interesting to see that even the ruin still retains some refinement and generosity. So that basic spatial layout, including the treatment of great materials, has survived all of this. And even though it's absolutely incredibly damaged by various interventions today, you can still feel like it was something decent. One of the architectural secrets that Luce knew really well is that if there's one long dimension in a space, that's enough to make it feel great. If they were separate rooms, they don't have any generosity or presence, but the way he was able to connect it into one thing like that, all of a sudden it's just airy and fantastic. Luce's certain obsession with symmetry is beautifully evident in two things here. The way the stone slabs are stacked so that the mirror images come together. And then on this door, which isn't a door, it's just a wardrobe cover, but together with the other door, it creates a symmetry. We're going to look at another realization of Adolf Luce in Pilsen. This would have been a generous apartment building, but today it's an office. Come and see what it looks like. A lot of Adolf Luce realizations are based on contrast, on the fact that you enter through a very narrow, small, dark corridor, and then the space gradually starts to open up, and then you enter some huge, beautiful, important hall. But here I experienced a spatial contrast that I think would have surprised even the author. When you enter through the long labyrinth of corridors in the office that destroyed the former tenement building, and then you find yourself here, the effect is really incredible. Today there are only two rooms left, the main living room and the dining room. But even this little fragment of the original apartment, I think, conveys the absolute level of Luce's design. So again, the same thing, symmetrical two mirrors opposite each other to make the space feel much bigger, beautiful materials, a fireplace made of half-timbered masonry, high proportions, monumentality, coziness at the same time. So again, we're in a world of our own where you forget everything around you, even the corridor we saw a moment ago. The principle that is clearly visible here, I think, can be called harmony and contrast. So you create a common base here. That's this solid stone, travertine. You cover almost everything with it. You create a base, and then you can hang anything you want on it. Different colors, different materials, different chairs, different designs, different accessories, because that one thing still holds it together. If you didn't have that, it's total chaos, but like this is the backdrop, and it's beautiful in itself. It's no problem. We're in the Krauss apartment, and if you go to Pilsen to see all of Luce realizations, you get to see the whole range. You'll see some that are superbly restored. You'll see some that are still waiting to be restored. You'll see some that are really ruins. And then there's this. You'll come into a room where it really doesn't look like it's by Adolf Luce. And it's no accident because parts of the documentation have not survived or any of the original state. So when the contemporary architects came in here to deal with this in some way, they decided to do these things in a new way so that they wouldn't mimic something from the past and to show clearly this is not what this thing ever looked like here. This is what we would do today. And in that part, to me, that's sort of the understandable approach. Because it's hard to imitate something that you don't understand exactly, that you don't have documentation for. But when we look at the main salon, that's where I see it as more complicated.
Again, in the main salon, connected to the dining room, we see a number of principles. That is, we see symmetry, two mirrors facing each other, beautiful stone panelling, a beautiful mahogany ceiling upstairs that ties it all together. But there's no surviving furnishings. And this is where the reconstructionists decided to put something like this in. And with all due respect to them, I think it's a complete mistake. It should not be here because the monumentality of the space just needs some subtle, small additions to the individual pieces of furniture where each one is different, each one has a slightly different design, a different color scheme, and doesn't compete with the main thing. And I think this competes terribly with that. At first glance, it looks similar. It's kind of simple geometry, simple color, but I don't think that's what's going on here. Having seen several of Adolf Loos's projects in Pilsen, we return to the most well-preserved and, in my opinion, probably the most striking apartment in Pilsen that Adolf Loos made here. And it's quite time to reiterate some of the principles because it disproves a lot of cliches about architecture. One of the most widespread cliches about architecture concerns the relationship between the house and the land. I think a lot of people think that in order to have something great, it has to be on an incredibly beautiful piece of land. The second cliche is about the relationship between coziness and monumentality. I think a lot of people feel that those things are mutually exclusive, that either something is generous, big, monumental, symmetrical, but then it can't be cozy. Or the other way around, it's kind of tiny, but then it doesn't have any real generosity. There's both. There's long sight lines, high spaces, quality materials, but then in some places it feels very good and very intimate. It's no fun to put those two things together, but here it is. Another cliche concerns the impossibility of combining artistry and practicality. You always think, yeah, it's beautiful, it's generous, it's certainly interesting, but it's going to be undoubtedly impractical. Here's a fantastic thing. It's called Enfilade. It's this long interconnection where you basically see the whole length of the apartment in one place. All the rooms build on each other like this. And it's an old Baroque principle that's really amazing but a lot of people probably think it's quite impractical. When you've got all the service here, you've got to carry some things and it's all got to move around here and there's company here, it doesn't really come together. But here, that's kept in mind as well. You just have to walk a few meters next door to find that there's a parallel route. The same link where suddenly all the service rooms, kitchens, bathrooms are connected to it and you can enter these things from the other side. The final cliche that I see being demolished here, and I think maybe the most important one, is that when you see these spaces for that kind of money, you probably think, why didn't they actually build a house somewhere outside the city in a green field that they could have made exactly to their liking? And they didn't. They fixed up the apartment. And I think it was mainly because they had a number of friends here and they didn't want to lose those friends. And those social ties were much more important to them than building a separate house somewhere because they were able to get the beauty and the quality inside anyway. And as kind of an added bonus, I think, is that when you're out on the street, you have no idea what it looks like inside, how much money these people have, what they've done for themselves, and that's not a bad thing at all. This is, I think, the true principle of really great architecture. I can make that paradise for you anywhere. So even if you're in a place like this, that's not particularly remarkable. When you're inside, you'll feel like you're in the best place in the world. And that's what you get a great architect for.